really great and we skipped over the slide maybe I'll go back if I can how gorgeous is that design for symmetry so first of all um, my name is Courtney Simons and I am a writer at Shopify as Max had mentioned but I've spent my whole life seeking out creative challenges that force me to work on my writing so I used to be a business journalist before that, I was a community reporter. I was just always finding ways to write in my day to day. And even though writing is now in my job title, I'm still writing uh, in other people's voices for other people's brands. So I really try hard to find excuses to keep my own skills going. So I'm here today on that creative endeavor to talk to you about symmetry. It's not a theme I'd ever really thought much about until this topic came about and I'm excited to share with you what I've learned. So I figured to start on the same page, it'd be useful to define symmetry. We all learned about it in school. It's a mathematical term, so it would have been in math class. And if you looked it up in the dictionary, you'd find that symmetry is the quality of being made up of exactly similar parts facing each other or around an axis. So that's a technical definition, but what does it mean for all of us? Where do we seek symmetry? But we actually find symmetry very beautiful. It's pleasing to our eyeballs. We've all heard that the most beautiful faces are the ones that are the most symmetrical. And I've learned that that's because when your face and body have good symmetry, it's a sign of good genes, healthy genes. And so evolutionarily, it makes sense to seek out someone who has symmetry because there's a better likelihood that your genes will be passed on through that symmetrical face. And we also can't stand it when things are out of place, when they're asymmetrical. I think it triggers the OCD in all of us when you see things like this, all these ducks in a row and one just off on its own. Or like this, like who would ever allow such a thing to happen? What monster would do this? And this, this lovely set of bushes, and then just one that could have closed the beautiful circle, and then instead it's up top. You find these examples all over the place, and they are horrifying to the eyeball. So I want to start by playing a bit of a game with you all, a symmetry game. I want us all to get a little bit silly, and I know that not everyone likes being silly, it might make you a little nervous, but I think just to loosen us all up and get us ready for the morning to start our creativity flowing, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor or someone close to you and choose one person to be the leader and one person to be the follower. And I want the leader to move their hands around in any weird shape or combination that they can think of, and I want the follower to mimic them in perfect symmetry. So I won't make you do it long, but you should start now if you can. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. <laughs> you can stop doing it now if you would like, but I like that some people are still going. That's awesome. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay. So maybe you're curious. Hi guys. That's always, I love when people are just so excited to connect that they're like, man, we gotta go back to listening to someone now. But I'm glad that everybody had a little brief moment. I saw some smiles and a little bit of awkwardness, but we all can use a little bit more of that, so it's all good. So why did we do that? Well, we often think of symmetry as being something that is exactly the same, but really it's something that's the exact opposite. So if you were the leader and you put your left hand up, your follower would have to use their right hand in order to mimic you. I thought that was kind of a fun paradox when we really usually think about symmetry as being something exactly the same. 
So I did a bunch of research on this topic because as I mentioned, I was new to the world of symmetry and shit got deep really fast. Like it's intense how mathematical and existential this topic can get. But I wanted to start small and I wanna share a couple of examples in nature of symmetry at work. So the first is bees and their honeycombs. Um, bees actually create perfectly symmetrical hexagons to store their honey in. They do on their own what humans can only do with a ruler and probably a compass. It's so cool that they're able to just do this. And scientists have speculated that this is likely because the shape allows them to store the most amount of honey with the least amount of wax. And there's no gaps between any of the honeycombs, so none of that honey goes to waste. It's nature at its most efficient, which is very cool. So this honeycomb is a type of wallpaper symmetry, that's what it's called. And you can see this kind of pattern in, no surprise, wallpaper, but also things like tiles and mosaics. And it's really easy to spot symmetry breaking in patterns like that, like this right here. Max was saying that she believes this has to be photoshopped because no one would ever allow something like this to exist in the world. So I'm not sure, but I hope so. So my next example, I'll bring the bees over to the next slide as well, but my favorite flower, sunflowers. They are an example of radial symmetry and more specifically, a mathematical and numerical symmetry um, that is part of the Fibonacci sequence. So I don't really want to dive too deeply into that, but basically uh, it's a mathematical set of irrational numbers where um, the number it consists of the two previous numbers added together. It doesn't really matter. We don't need to focus on it. But the, the reality is that if you were to count every single seed on a sunflower, it would always end up being a number in the Fibonacci sequence. And that is true for a lot of flowers and plants and leaves. It's why it's so hard to find a four-leaf clover, because four is not a number in the Fibonacci sequence which I thought was really cool. So why do these sunflowers care about mathematical principles like these? Again, it comes back to efficiency. If these seeds are positioned just right with a ratio between their petals and their seeds, they can fit the most amount of seeds in there. And again, evolutionarily, it'll help them pass those seeds on to continue their lineage. So another example in nature, and I'm really sorry for the crappy photograph, but I just came back from a trip to Portugal, and I was in a botanical garden, and there were a bunch of beautiful peacocks just wandering around freely. I got like maybe a little too close to this one. They can be actually a little scary, very close, but beautiful from afar. And um, it was funny because in my research, peacocks actually came up as an example of something called bilateral symmetry. So if you were to cut this beautiful peacock in half, please don't, but if you did, each side would be exactly symmetrical, just like the human body is meant to be. I came across a funny example um, of how Charles Darwin, during his you know, origin of species days when he was developing his, his theories, he hated peacocks because they were too beautiful. He said, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Because he thought, why would any creature spend so much of their energy towards something so beautiful but so not an essential for survival. It didn't make sense to him until he tweaked his theory to account for sexual selection. So the fact that the prettier the peacock, the more the other peacocks are gonna be like, yeah, I want that. And <laughs> thus the world made sense again for Mr. Darwin. <laughs> this, okay, one more example and this one's really cool. So the sun has a diameter of 1.4 million kilometers, but the moon's diameter is only just under 3,500. And yet, every few months, we experience a solar eclipse where the moon is able to fully cover the sun's light. Now, the reason for this is because although the sun is like 400 times wider than the moon, it's also 400 times further away from the Earth. So they look the exact same size because of this symmetry in the ratio. And I find that really interesting. There's also some scientists who think that this sun-moon symmetry might even be the secret ingredient that allows human life to exist at all. 
which I thought was just super cool. So like I said, things got really deep, like even things like physics, the laws of nature, all of these things can be brought back to symmetry. I'm sure you've heard of the natural law um, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That applies here too. But I know we're not here to talk about physics. We are here to talk about creativity and how symmetry ties into that topic. So how do we get there? I want to share a quote with physicists, uh, with you, by physicist and author Alan Lightman, who said, what we like most is mostly symmetry with a little asymmetry mixed in. So the laws of physics, as I mentioned, are shaped by symmetries, but there are examples of symmetry breaking all around us. That's why if you look hard enough, you can find a four-leaf clover because symmetry does break. If the universe was a perfect balance between matter and antimatter, as is the natural state of things, there would just be a void. Nothing could exist at all. We're all here today only because of symmetry breaking in the universe, which I think is kind of beautiful. Okay, so time for another creative exercise. You may have seen a little sheet of paper and perhaps a pen on your chair. Maybe you have um, your own notebook that you would prefer to use. Feel free to share a pen with a stranger if you uh, have an extra one. I would love you all to think about doodling something perfectly symmetrical. So you can start with a line of symmetry if you want to. Uh, or just draw whatever you want and draw something perfectly symmetrical. But then I want you to add an element of asymmetry. Maybe just one tiny little doodle or mark that makes it not quite perfectly symmetrical, but kind of adds to it. So if you need some creative um, persuasion, you can start with one of these ideas just as a base. And I'm only going to give you less than a minute to do it. So just a really quick exercise to put pen to paper. Okay, so I'll keep going. Feel free to keep doodling if you would like. Um, I'm going to go back to Alan Lightman because he's a really good guy to quote in a talk like this one. He also said, if everything is perfectly symmetric, and this is including a work of art, we find it boring. On the other hand, if everything is random with no symmetry at all, we're confused. And so you want to sort of navigate between boredom on the one hand and confusion on the other. It's all about balance. That word came up so much during my research. We as creative people live our best creative lives when we are balanced. And that can mean a whole bunch of different things. It can be a balance between structure in our lives and creativity. It can be a balance between who we really are and who we say we are. More specifically, even a balance between who we are in the real world versus who we portray ourselves to be online. I've been thinking about symmetry as having an axis, you know, a line down the middle. And that axis can be a phone, it can be a mirror, it can be any divider. And if on each side there's too big of a mismatch, we feel off balance. It's almost like life is a tightrope and we have to kind of stay close to the line in order for us to not fall off the wire. Uh, I think we're all trying to look for ways in our lives to be balanced, and for me, taking on creative projects has always really helped me with that uh, journey. So anyone who knows me knows that I really love haikus. I love writing them, I love reading them. They're so simple and beautiful. And thinking about this talk, they're actually quite symmetrical. For those of you who want a refresher or don't know, it's a three-line poem where the first line is five syllables, the second is seven, and the third is five again. I um, write haikus all the time for fun, and I decided to take on a few years ago a creative challenge called the 100-Day Project, where I decided to write a haiku every single day for 100 days and share about it online. I'll share a couple with you quickly, just in the interest of being friendly with you all. Here's one. The grass is green here. I don't care what shade it is on the other side. And used to pluck petals, crude depiction of self-worth. Not even your odd. <laughs> and then this one for all of us who have suffered through the depths of winter, a reminder, wait out the seasons. They will always call it quits long before you do. 
<laughs> We're almost there. We could do this. So I would highly encourage any of you to take on a 100-day project. I am always amazed at how open the portal of my mind becomes by the end of it, and I am always a better writer at the end. Caitlin Teed, one of the organizers, recently finished her own 100 Days of Jokes. So it just goes to show you can do absolutely anything that you want to. And I'm curious if anyone in this room would ever consider doing a challenge like this or has done one in the past. Awesome, that's really heartening because this year's challenge officially starts on April 2nd. If anyone's looking for a jump start to their creativity, it's a great way to force yourself to get your button gear. The website's there, 100dayproject.org, and you can sign up for their newsletter if you'd like to get reminders on dates and things. Or you could start tomorrow, really. You can do it whenever you want to. It's just a really good forcing function um, to make you open up your mind. I just committed a couple days ago to doing my fourth 100-day project, and I want to share with you the quote that inspired me to do it. No matter what your age or your life path, whether making art is your career or your hobby or your dream, it is not too late or too egotistical or too selfish or too silly to work on your creativity, which I think that it just speaks for itself. It's a great quote. Okay, so all this talk about haikus and symmetry, we can't not write one, right? <laughs> so I want all of us, I know it might seem weird and might seem like I'm asking a lot, but I want us to, to write a haiku right now in real time. I'm only gonna give you maybe two to three minutes, so it's not gonna be perfect, but it can be about anything. It can be about your morning, uh, maybe about nature or a little short story you can fit, but a reminder that it's only three lines. The first one's five syllables, then seven syllables, and then five again. So I'm going to write one too so that you're not doing this alone, and uh, I'll check back with you in like two or three minutes. Good luck. <laughs> Okay, so how did that feel? Did anybody successfully write a three-line poem in that amount of time? Yes, awesome. Okay, so I know that all of you know this, but being a, a writer or any kind of creative at all is a really vulnerable place to be in sometimes. And it's difficult to share some of the things that we create. So in the interest of vulnerability, I will share what I just wrote. It's not very good, but I don't care because I know you won't judge me and I know you can tell that if I worked harder, I could come up with something better. All right, so mine was nerves electrified. Can they see my hands shaking? Heart threatens to burst. That's mine. So being vulnerable, I, yeah, physiological responses, is, they're so hard to beat. I don't feel that nervous, but my body still betrays me, you know? Anyways, I would love if anyone in the audience is willing to make themselves equally vulnerable and share what they just wrote. Doesn't need to be perfect. Yes, perfect, there's a hand. Okay, let's hear it. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. That's so great. Okay, who's next? Yeah. Some things are more important. Maybe I should quit. <laughs> oh, whoa. Excellent. If you ever do quit, you'll have to publish that haiku. <laughs> awesome. Oh, there you go. Yeah, how about you? Oh, amazing. Thank you. This is so great. Okay, one more. Excellent. Needed coffee first, but without the croissant, I won't go to the gym. Amazing. I love that. And that's what I love about haikus. They can be silly, somber, mood setting. I love seeing people tap out the syllables on their thighs. I'm very familiar with that, like always counting. It's, it's 
surprising how hard it is sometimes to count the syllables. Um, I really, really appreciate this, and I would encourage you all to share your haikus later today. Maybe come up to me afterwards, because I'd love to hear more of them. So I want to take us into um, a take-home creative challenge next. And this one, uh, we're not going to have time to do in person, but I want to give you homework for later. So I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a diamond poem or diamante poem. It's traditionally a seven-line poem, where the first line is one word, then two words, three, four, three, two, one. It forms the shape of a diamond. And it doesn't have to be seven lines. Um, it can be as many as you want or as few as you want, as long as it follows that general structure. So keeping that vulnerability theme going, I'm going to share a terribly emo poem with you from 2004 when I was in high school and I wrote, stop, the beat of my heart is too fast when you leave and take my air. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I shared it on Instagram because I used it as a throwback Thursday version for one of my creative challenges where I published poems for 100 days. Um, but for a more contemporary example, I uh, actually, when I just told you I came back from a trip to Portugal, and plane rides are always a really creative time for me. Maybe it's just because I feel like I have this time where I can't really do anything else, but I always like to put pen to paper, and it's not usually very good, but it's just something to keep my hands moving. So this one is not a diamond poem yet, but I'll share with you this sort of crappy first draft. It goes, flight path, right track, sky high, fly by, hours obliterated by time zones, days robbed and regiven, Plentiful strangers existing together, the voluntary containment happily constrained in a large silver bird, heavier than anything natural, walls thin as thick pancakes. But we sign up. We wonder too much. What's on the other side? So I wrote this just like word association, just for fun. But on my way home from my trip, when I was starting to think about this talk, I wondered if maybe I could make it better by rewriting it in the diamond structure. So this is what I came up with. It's a little bit better. Flight, sky high, we fly by, days robbed and regiven, hours obliterated by time zones, plentiful strangers existing together, the voluntary containment, happily constrained escape. So it's kind of cool to pare away all the stuff that's like really not that good and leave the gems, the diamonds that remains, uh, which I thought was really fun. So as a take home challenge for you all, perhaps you will choose to write a diamond poem from scratch or take an existing piece of prose or any kind of writing at all and rewrite it in this structure. For a final take home challenge, I'd love you all to try to be mindful today of symmetry. Look for examples in your walk back to the office, maybe your drive home tonight. You can seek out symmetry in architecture, in nature, people walking by in their outfits, anything at all. And I would encourage you to take a photo of it and capture it. I did that recently on my last morning in Lisbon. I was inspired to take this photo. Not a photographer, not the best, but it struck me. Uh, I loved the symmetry of the window panes, but then I was also equally struck by the asymmetry between the church on the left-hand side and the rolling hills on the right, as well as the light bulb on the left and the handle of the window on the right there as well. So why do I show you this pretty awful photo? Because sharing is caring, guys. <laughs> It really is. So first of all, congratulations to all of you for having created something before 10 a.m. on a Friday. You've done more today than what many people do in their whole lives creatively, and that's not a lie. Um, so I also would encourage you to be vulnerable and share one thing. It can be your doodle, maybe it's your haiku, perhaps it's a photo from later on today. But if you do, feel free to tag hashtag CMSymmetry. Ottawa is creative, I love that. I feel like we should all keep trying to keep making that hashtag a thing. Um, you can tag the Ottawa Creative Morning Crew and I would love if you tagged me as well just because I'm really curious about what you all came up with. So that uh, is an open challenge to all of you. So some closing thoughts real quick. I 
I think a lot of people in this world are happy living symmetrical lives. The lives that people think that they should live, the lives that look like everyone else. Symmetry is beautiful, it's pleasing to the eye, but it's not challenging. You've figured out one side and you've figured out it all. I think that us in the room this morning, we are the symmetry breakers. I think we're the ones who fight against symmetry, intentionally and unintentionally. And I think there's something beautiful about that. So it's easy to see why people want symmetry. It's perfection, and it's easy to get stuck in the art of trying to be perfect. But I'll share one more quote, because I love it, by Elizabeth Gilbert, who's an author I also love. I think perfectionism is just fear, in fancy shoes and a mink coat. <laughs> so I'm not saying that you shouldn't seek balance in your lives. Absolutely, you should seek out symmetry and so that you can feel like you're a balanced human being. But I also would say, don't be afraid to lean a little further on one side of the line, and don't be afraid to share the creative creations that result when you do. Thank you. How many of you are a girl boss? When she came to town? If you know, you know, I guess, yeah. Hi. Um, as you know, Courtney was the interviewee, I suppose, the interviewer. I was the interviewer. <laughs> um, and I was blown away because she did a better job than Robot. Sorry, I said that <laughs> you did. So I am honored and terrified to be on your side this time. And oh, I'd yeah. like to just start off with a question about you. I noticed you didn't share much about you at all um, in that talk. So I'm curious as to, you know, what is, like, what do you do? How did you end up there? Um, what motivates you? You pick one of those. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, I'm always trying to find ways to write. And I originally thought that being a journalist would be a really good way to do that. So, I went, my family lives near Toronto. I moved to Ottawa to go to journalism school. And I, I loved it. I started as a community reporter, which is this weirdly validating experience where very few people read your paper, but the ones that do frame the articles and put them on the fridge about their son in like the local fair's pumpkin growing contest or whatever it is, it means so much to them. So I really loved how people invited me into their homes and I had so much free reign. I wrote like a first person narrative about what it was like to learn to sail a sailboat. Full disclosure, I didn't like really learn, but I had I spent a couple of hours and I tried it. Um, so that was really fun. And then I transitioned into uh, business journalism after actually losing my job. The newspaper I was at collapsed into another, as we see so often in the media industry right now. And I was sort of just set adrift. Um, and that was really hard, but I found footing working at the Ottawa Business Journal. And that was such a strange victory for me because I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about technology, which was my beat. I was like, yeah, I'm a technology reporter. Sure, of course I am. Uh, and I just sort of learned as I went, and that eventually led me to where I am now at Shopify, uh, where I am a ghostwriter, actually. So I write in the voice of other people, and it's really nice to be able to spend at least some time every single day writing. But, like I said, there's always room for, for my own voice. I need to make sure I, I don't lose that along the way, I feel. So fake it till you make it? It's more like not even fake it. It's more just like mm, admit that we're all students always, even the people that have been doing it for years and decades. Like the year that you stop viewing yourself as a student is the year that just nobody wants to hang out with you anymore. So just remembering that we always all have something to learn and as long as you're receptive and you take the lessons and you're not afraid of getting feedback, even if it feels like a little hard sometimes, um, then as long as you keep trying, then that's, you're good to go. Fair. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, for one more from me and then hopefully some from you. Um, Marwan is standing by with the mic, so we'll go just raise your hand and, and he'll come by with the mic. So last one, uh, you quickly touched on this idea of ghostwriting, which I find really interesting, um, kind of embodying a different a, a voice. Like I wonder, um, what does it take to do something like that? Are you like always following Toby's footsteps and knowing everything that he thinks? Like how do you kind of get into his mindset? 
Yeah, so I have been working with uh, Toby, the CEO of Shopify, as his ghostwriter. And it's a, it's a weird term because no one likes to think, oh, he doesn't write his own things. That's not really true. It's very much a collaboration. And he is a very gifted writer, but uh, he just has a million other things that he's very responsible for doing. So I sort of help him get all his crazy ideas in his head down on paper. And the best way that I've learned to help with that is uh, when I started, I created what I call the Toby Repository. And so I went combed through every interview he's ever done, everything he's ever written, everything he's ever said and tweeted, and I alphabetized it by topic <laughs> with a link so that I can pull upon things that he's already said and thought and done so that I'm not ever inventing anything for him. It's literally that I'm just helping him synthesize his thoughts and ideas in places that they already exist. And uh, that's been a really, it was a really rewarding way to, to start things off, so I really felt comfortable. And then you really just have to not be embarrassed to show something to someone. Like, it's very daunting. Imagine me writing something and being like, this is you. you like, this is your voice. What do you think? It's so easy to be like, no, I would never write it like that. It's just, it's, it can be tricky. Um, but we figured out a good collaborative working relationship where it's never that I'm going rogue. We're very much working together, and it feels really good. Wonderful. So we'll open up to you now if you have any questions for Courtney. Just throw up your hand. Come on, there's got to be. Got you all prepped. Two, one, done. There we go. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> They're called Mike Runners. This is going to be somewhat unrelated, but cool. in the email that went out, it said that you live in a log cabin. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> I do, actually. So I live just south of the city in a village called Metcalf. It's about a 25-minute drive if I don't have traffic. And it is just that. It's a, a log home. Uh, it was built by the previous owners. And they're just like the biggest, roundest logs you can imagine on all four sides. There's a, a porch going around three of the sides. And it's super rustic. Log homes are actually a lot harder to maintain than you think. I was just like, it's beautiful. It'll last forever. But you have to stain it and treat it and make sure it's like windproof and waterproof and sunproof and all these things. But um, I've always loved having the combination of working downtown in the city and having all the energy that a city offers, but then being able to retreat and go somewhere quiet and have another way to recharge my batteries, especially creatively. And uh, I do a lot, it's so cliche, but I do so much writing on the front porch uh, of my log home. So I, yeah, it's a, a really fun experience, especially right now in the winter when snow falls, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You used all your creativity with that. <laughs> I drained them. Oh, it's sort of it. oh, yay, there's a couple more. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, based on symmetry, like, preach to like, balance, I mean, you know, the idea of like, common business where like, your thoughts need to match your behaviors. Yes. So that I actually was thinking a lot about for this talk, and specifically I was thinking about how it applies to social media. So I keep talking about this trip I just came back from, because it was so much fun, but I consciously, while I was there, made a point of not being on social media. So I didn't publish any photos, I, did, I took a bunch of bad ones, as I shared, but I didn't um, publish any of them. Because I was just trying to experiment and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't putting out this image of like, look how perfect my life is. I do these wonderful <laughs> things and everyone should be jealous of my life because we know that things can be so curated online. And so I've swung to different extremes. I mean, when I do my creative challenges, I'm posting once every single day because it's part of the challenge. It's not really me, it's more my, my writing works. It feels a little different, but then I swing the other way. And you'll notice whenever I finish a challenge, I'm like, nope. Like, I just won't publish for weeks at a time. I won't share anything. So now I'm like kind of bringing it back to the middle. Again, it's a balance. And as long as I'm being true to who I am as a real person right now sitting here, then I'm fully comfortable sharing things and being like, hey, this is my life. Maybe you want a peek into it. Um, but yeah, I would just encourage everyone to kind of do an audit of like, how does this make you feel? Do you, do you feel good when you share these things or do you feel 
depressed because you're trying to pretend to be these things and you're not. Um, I feel like social media should enhance our lives and it shouldn't make us feel shittier about ourselves. So just trying to find that middle ground. I've been working on that. Yeah. Hi. This one? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Hi. Um, you touched quickly on it being your fourth 100 Days Project. For people taking this on for the first time and looking to keep motivated to do the full 100 days, what would you suggest? Okay. Definitely choose something that will only take you between 5 to 15 minutes a day. Because otherwise, I've seen people sign themselves up for like one hour of making every day. And it's like, no, nobody's got time for that. Some days you will, but then you'll just feel defeated on the days that you won't. So something that you can just fit within a small gap of time that you really do feel is achievable. Another thing too, and this was actually uh, new advice to me, is to ch choose something that's generative. And by that I mean like don't start from scratch every day. Choose a theme for yourself or choose like something out of a hat every day. Like give yourself a writing prompt every day that can help dictate, sorry, not just writing, I'm so biased. Whatever, a design prompt, a photography prompt, something that helps you have a, a place to start from so that every single day you're not like, oh my God, I could write about everything. Like I've learned that there's so much creativity in constraint. Sometimes having a box, you can like flirt with the edges, but like at least it's like a, a playing field that you know you're gonna show up in. Um, and tell people that you're gonna do it. That public accountability factor really helps, whether or not it should. I mean, I should just do it for my own damn self, I know, but like when I tell people I'm gonna do it, like I'm doing right now for all of you, it's a really good motivator to be like, I am a person of my word. I will do this. <laughs> so, yeah. I really hope you decide to do one. That'd be awesome. Was there one last hand I think I saw? Same row? Yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, it's kind of close to the last question. Um, I was wondering if you have any particular rituals or. I have a bizarre ritual where I love the bathtub. It's, it's a weird place, but I like, I, it's kind of weird and formulaic. I like take a big tray and I load it up with like chocolate and tea and wine and water and candles and a book light and my book and a notebook and just all kinds of things. It's a big tray and I bring it up and I like turn on the water, turn off the lights, turn on the candles, and I just sort of just sit with my thoughts. I find that if I force myself to be in a closed space where I don't promise that I'll do anything else but right, um, that is, is key. And then also just knowing that like the first thing you write is never gonna be amazing. Oh, maybe it will, but just don't be afraid to write anything down. Half the stuff in my notebooks is just garbage, but it's a way to connect my brain to my hand to the paper. Uh, and I find that once I start writing words, even if they're nonsense words, even if they're just anything like elephant, pink, anything, then it really helps me to get going. Um, and I think it helps to just not edit as you go, just continually flow. Don't worry, you can clean things up later, but that creative muse might just like leave your head at any given moment. So I appreciate pen to paper, but if I'm having a really, you know those moments where like things just start coming really fast, I'll often like to use my notes app or a laptop then just because I can type faster than I can write. But when it's slower, like usual, I use a pen. Thank yeah. you for asking that. I'm so yeah. Sure. And um, we're gonna close this off. Um, but thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. I think thank we can you. All agree. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.